Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or our shortened title, IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association. So as part of our efforts to promote play, we've introduced Porch Play Chats, which are conversations with people who are just as passionate about play as we are. I'm Deb Lawrence, and I'm the president of IPA USA. And uh, with me on the porch today is Lisa Murphy and Mike Huber. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> so I'm going to give you where you can find more porch play chat. So if you go to the IPAUSA.org website, and up in that top right hand corner is our Instagram, our Facebook, and our YouTube links to our pages and um, uh, channels. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you become a friend on the Facebook page and Instagram, every Monday, magically, a new Porch Play Chat will appear in your feed. So Mike is joining us today. And those of you who are Porch Play Chat groupies know about Mike. And Mike has really expanded my view um, as we've had these conversations. Mike has dedicated his life to serving children, families in the field of early childhood. He's been an early childhood teacher since 1992. He's the author of Embracing Rough and Tumble Play and Teaching with the Body and Mind, which you can get through Redleaf Press. He's done six picture books, including The Amazing Eric. And now is it seven, Mike? Do I not have that right yet? No, it's six picture books. Okay, good. Right. Yeah. And but you have a new book coming out in November. And what's that one? So that one is called Inclusion Includes Us, Inclusion. Building Bridges and Removing Barriers in Early Childhood Classrooms. I might have that last wording slightly No, nope, it's 100% correct. I'm looking at the draft. <laughs> Look at that. And awesome. by the time this video is out, it'll be out because it's only like hopefully five days away from being out. Oh my goodness, you must be so excited. It's I like know, having right? a baby. I, I know, know, I know. Well, yeah, yeah, and it probably took that long to it give does. birth well, to the new it was the longer. Pain is earlier. It's the, like this part's been pretty easy. <laughs> well, the <laughs> little opposite there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. And I shouldn't be the one talking about that, I suppose. But um, yeah. Anyways, and so, I will say, I, I was I was very graciously honored to be able to review it not review review like that but to read it to get first glance on it before it actually went to press and i will say right now hands down that if you're watching this listening to this it is definitely something you're going to want to invest in and have a part of your library and i'm mm -hmm. not just saying that because i know mike and i like mike i'm saying that because it is high quality content so this topic today is how do our structures and institutions disable children from playing yikes <laughs> yeah no big topic here um no big yeah, topic. and maybe yeah. it's always I'm like gonna, like light lifting with you exactly exactly <laughs> but i'm gonna start with just explaining that disable language because that really comes from the social model of disability mm -hmm. which basically um is the idea that people aren't disabled aren't prevented from doing things because of their impairment you know, the impairment is part of them, but it's the way we structure either things physically, the way we, our attitudes about things, um, the way we schedule things mm -hmm. that prevents people from doing things. So we disable someone who can't use those round doorknobs mm -hmm. um, to get in, you know, if they can't get into a building or we disable a person who needs, you know, sidewalks and uh, curb cuts to get, get around. And I think for me and probably a lot of non-disabled people, we think of those mostly in physical terms. Mm -hmm. But um, the truth is a lot of it's more about the attitudinal or informational things. And so anyways, I, had, I was thinking about that social model of disability. And then when I was thinking about the Right to Play Right Now conference during the unconference portion, <laughs> and hearing people's stories about how they're trying to do play in their programs, but they couldn't, and all of the reasons were because of the structures put in place. And so it suddenly dawned on me, oh, we're disabling um, 
people from or children from playing or adults too, I suppose. And mm -hmm. so I realized that this disability uh, model actually works really well, this social model of disability when we're talking about play. So um, one of the yeah. readings that I, I read lately was talking about how if the child can actually play while they're in the space, does that necessarily imply that they have to be using the equipment? And that was a little like, <clears throat> for me, I'm like, right? Who am I to know if that child as, as even as Heather, who has just joined us, as Heather even said uh, earlier when we were talking with her, is like, how could I be so bold as to think like that I know what's going on in that kid's brain, right? right. So if, if this child is playing in the space, then to some degree, the space is accessible. Right. Whether or not he or she or they can get on the swing, because maybe the swing isn't really what they're there for. Right. And you could see it in the way that... Um... Like, so thinking of an early childhood program, children often line up, mm. right, in some way. And lining up is usually putting kids together in very close space, but they still are going to play. Mm -hmm. And then it's the attitude of the adults that's going to try to stop that, to squash that, because how dare you play, you know, while, while we're, we're in line, go somewhere, right? Rather than um, you know, playing along with the kids or realize, yeah, if there's a railing, um, I know we did an episode. So with Ross Thompson was talking about at his last, well, two workplaces ago now, um, they had a railing or like a little, like a wall, you know, sort of a, and when they would go to go back into the school, kids would climb up on the wall, you know, it was two, two and a half feet up, just like a retaining wall. And most of the teachers spent so much time get off the wall we're lining up it's not time to play mm -hmm. you know so they're literally disabling the children from playing um mm -hmm. probably the most extreme example i heard at the conference um was someone talking about they had an organization where they would go into schools and help the children play outside essentially like how to do nature play so they're teaching the teachers but also giving the children like an hour in the morning of actually playing that way. And then they meet with the teachers, I don't know, once at the end of the week or whatever to talk about how they did that. And they kept finding programs that couldn't do it because their reading time was in the morning. And so yeah. they couldn't have this group come in and thinking, yeah, the person's like, this is, we're offering free training with us being on site for a week. So we're talking about thousands of dollars of free professional development and um, whatever you want to call them, enhancement for the children. But no, we can't do it because the reading time's in the morning. And so even that lack of imagination, perhaps it's too warm there, so they can't be as creative. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I saw what you did That there. was an earlier conversation <laughs> off camera. Um, but they weren't being um, creative enough. Open-minded. Could we shift for one week? It wasn't even saying, let's shift it all together or let's question what reading time is and uh, all that. That's a different one. But even just, sorry, we're going to, we can't take this. And it was just, um, yeah, I don't know. What, and so that's where I, that's what that story is when that first came into my head that, oh, we are literally disabling children. from play. So. And I think we do that with regardless of ability level. <laughs> we do that every day in right. classrooms. I witness it all the time when yeah. I go in to observe. It's not time and, for that. It's not time for that. It's yeah. not time for that. Oh, yeah. Put that away, even though you're not done and you're going to have to start all over from the beginning when you take it back out because you I didn't give you enough time to finish. But the clock says it's time to move on. Right. And, exactly. Yeah. We have to go by the clock, not by the child. Yeah. It, and it goes back to um, I want to go back to a reference that Heather made earlier. It's like playing teacher. Right. Yeah. I'm going to do this. And I, I thought that was an amazing descriptor of what I think we're facing in this advocacy that we need to do about choice and taking initiative for children and allowing them to risk and all of those things are just compounded right. by 
these barriers that we put up that we really don't have other than it's reading time. Yeah, yeah. Ego a, barriers. A good rationale for. So, yeah. um, and I think, but the other thing you always have to go back to, people fear change. It, you know, oh, I've done this this way for 25 years. Um, and, you know, and I always come back and say, does it work? <laughs> you know, right. Is it working? Oh, I put children in timeout. I've been doing that for 25 years. Does it work? Right, right. I go, and not often. Okay, let's try something. It's all I know, but it's all all I I know. know. It's the only tool in my tool belt. If you only have a hammer, then everything's a nail. And that's why I adopted the the tool belt metaphor early in the speaking was that I'm not taking your freaking hammer away. I just want you to realize that there's some things that need other tools. Yeah, yeah. So here's a litany of them. Let's see what fits. So talk to us more about how we're, how with children who might have an impairment. All right. Oh, look, I mean, I, as an adult, yeah. have an impairment. I walk into walls. I trip right, right. over flat floors. I mean, really, it's bad. <laughs> Each of us is you know not a perfectly organized human being i mean we right. have some difference in our abilities between the person next to us but but i think in particular i feel like it's the children who have different abilities yeah who seem to be restricted the most because a, a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I do think that the adult plays a big part in that, um, partly because children are still learning how to play with each other, mm-hmm. right? So if some kids are playing a chase game, um, they will, okay, we're going to do, you know, I'm a shark and you're the, the minnows or whatever, <laughs> run. And other kids are running and then, and this is a real example that I saw on a playground, child in the wheelchair, they pause, but they can't figure out how do we include this child? So mm-hmm. they just bypass her, you know? Right. right. And it um, took an adult at the wheelchair, oh, you know, like talk to the child. Um, child's nonverbal. So I think, um, I think there were sort of more yes, no signs at this point. But do you want to have a turn being the shark? Oh, and then told all the kids, guess what? She's the shark now. And so the adults like pushing the wheelchair, but the the children, once they, oh, she's playing too. Then when they were the shark, they were also trying to get the child in the wheelchair, but they needed that adult to build that bridge Mm -hmm. to have them do that. That children are going to, they're just learning how to um, negotiate with other kids, how to interact with other kids so if there's something that oh boy i don't know how to figure this out Mm -hmm. like if you were whatever you know kicking a ball but this child can't kick i yeah like i don't you know i barely can ask have three people playing this game you know i'm not going to try to figure out how to do it with someone who might move the ball in a different way Mm -hmm. and that that's where an adult can really help that um but I also want to think about the examples of the adult who will say, oh, you know, we're, we were going to go on a hike, but she's in a wheelchair, you know, or she's. In so it's a all her fault. <laughs> it's all her fault. Yeah. Well, 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 which is never actually said, but it is to some yes. degree implied, right? Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, Mike, if you think that to your wheelchair example specifically, maybe have there been messages from an inaccessible environment that taught the kids to just go around instead of try to include um maybe not in that specific possible. example yeah but... yeah i think it's more about it that's just new to them yeah so that they don't know same thing if a child's using um, a tablet to talk and they don't know you know it's going to take a little longer but then they can listen to it and then and, and often what we do is have them oh are there things you want to try to say or ask the child to show you how to say. Yeah. And so that child can teach the other kids how to use their tablet. Um, mm-hmm. And that actually really helps them see the, you know, the person as a play partner. So I think part of it's just the novelty and it's just like, whoa, what are we gonna do? And what, or, but some of it is also attitude, right? That 
sure. in the store, the child's like, why, why is that person in a wheelchair? And the adult is usually like, oh, let's not ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's like, I think they know they're in a wheelchair. I think I've already yeah. used this one before, but the, that, that person knows they're in a wheelchair. They're not like, what? Oh my God. <laughs> Actually, I will say that we, when um, I had kids visit a nursing home that um, there was, you know, kids like, you know, why do you, why don't you have any legs? And the guy just would, you know, like, oh my good gosh, what happened to, you know, like, and the kids were like, what? <laughs> like, no, no. He's like, I had a big owie a long time ago. That's how he would explain it. But he would usually joke first, like, oh, <laughs> whoa, where'd they go? But but yes, that's an icebreaker though. And I think even, even as children get older, I'm sure that they probably develop that, you know, what is the quickest way to make a positive connection with this person that's approached me? And for some of them, I think it would be humor to some degree. Yeah, right. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that some of the disability can be around um, neurodiversity or uh, mental health or, you know, other less visible Mm -hmm. um barriers because like I said I know for me before doing this book and before having a child with autism I didn't notice those things as much so having an echoey space mm -hmm. like great we're all going into the gym and for a child who can't handle that oh, sensory yeah. <laughs> sound you just disabled them from like mm -hmm. and probably they're going to be you know dysregulated crying screaming maybe even hitting people near them because it's so loud that other children aren't going to be playing either, right? Mm -hmm. And the teacher's just going to feel stressed and not, you know, so having a plan around that, I mean, I know we can't always choose our spaces, but having a plan around that, I know one thing quickly for a child of, I don't know when this was, a year ago, was having the lights lower, at least so the sensory, it's the lights aren't a problem, even though the sound is, now we can put headphones or, you know, offer him headphones and then he can, you know, um, in the mats, there's usually mats in a gym and like going under a mat, you know, so now he's figuring out ways he can be part of the room. But when you have- I, I, want, I want you to comment out, on that. I yeah. want you to comment on how an adult, this is part of the reading that I held up, yeah. how adults often are the ones who have like, uh, that's not how you're supposed to be playing here. Um, right. so the adult gets uncomfortable and will perceive the kid under the mat as something's wrong. Come be like the people that I'm more familiar yes. with. Right. Um, and that's going to add more dysregulation. So making room for maybe what might be different to somebody's eyes, but realize to some degree that child is still now playing and participating. Right. That's yeah. And that's, possible. yeah. So I'm going to have to blow everyone's mind here, right? That your experience is not the only experience that oh, everyone has. Shut up. <laughs> really? Oh, okay. But, but it's important, right, that that I, because it's easy to go to that point, and it's also okay that that's where you go first. But right, if, you, as long as you don't get stuck there. Yes. Yeah. But that's where you want to pause and observe. So now I'm thinking like, uh, you know, uh, what's her name? Marjorie Carter. Uh, Marjorie uh, Carter? Yes. Margie Carter, and, um, and Halo, you know, just that idea of let's pause and watch the child and get to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And some of it could be related to, you know, an impairment or whatever word you want to use. I guess for neurodivergence, I would refer to that as a condition, not impairment necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it could be just a child's interests, because who cares if that's, the child's really interested in caves and that's why they're going under. That's also legitimate. Um, it could be they've never been under a mat. What is it like under there? I only see what's the top. Smell part. like? And what's it smell like? Oh, yeah. I would not want to know that. You know, yeah. Mimi, Mimi Shenfield used to say, and I, I've held this in my tool belt since I heard her say it the first time. She said, "We need watchers, players, participators." Right? The definition yes. of participate means ninety-nine different things, and mm -hmm. some people are going to want to throw the ball and be active, and other people might be on the sidelines watching, don't mm -hmm. want to do it. Some people are waiting for an invitation, and some might be under the mat and one hundred percent still engaged in the experience, but it maybe mm -hmm. looks a little different to your yeah. own. Yeah, and thank you for bringing her up too, because I met her I once. And I think it just changed my life. It was right uh -huh. before I became an author. And I think, oh. yeah, 
you know she's amazing yeah i, I have the cards okay. i send her i i had the privilege of picking her up she was doing a keynote in colorado with the aeyc and i got to pick her up and had her for an hour yeah it was for those of you who don't know her um teaching in the key of life, of life. Just oh, oh, oh. on my bookshelf yeah. Mimi you know, Stenfield, just, yeah. and I and, and I'm gonna digress here, and then we'll come back, Mike. But I yeah, one yeah. of the things that she we had her on the childcare bar and uh, bar and girl podcast, and we just let her talk. We're like, were you gonna shut her off after thirty? No, you just let them talk. We'll figure it out. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> and she said one of her biggest concerns was that we had lost as a profession, we had lost our spot. And if you're a dancer or know what I'm talking about, when you learn how to spin and, you know, you have a spot literally on the wall of the studio where you learn how to spin and you whip your head around. And she said, we've lost our spot. And that's why we keep falling around. That's why we keep tumbling because mm -hmm. we've lost sight of what really, really matters in our profession. And on that, I love you. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I just wanted to bring it up though. Cause I, I, I don't feel I bring up her name up enough, but yet. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of what I see in well, Lisa and Heather, in in what you say, it's like, man, she's been, she's been saying this for decades, <laughs> for decades. Yes. And anyways, bare um, feet with her drum, bump, yeah. bump, bump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, back to the topic. So another one I want to bring up that happens in classrooms, why things don't happen, is because uh, I have a success story here. But thinking about those things like calendar time. No. <sighs> uh, child jobs you know job charts uh weather bear whatever all of those things that take oh god dan is rolling over in his <laughs> oh grave god. right no, now no, I, I this can, podcast is gonna be cursed <sighs> i can feel it um <laughs> you know it's like we take all this time doing that it's like well we don't have time to play mm -hmm. right Why? we're wasting the time yeah um, oh it's recently it, it, I, oh go ahead no, no, go ahead because okay. I'll get on a rant and it won't be Recently, good. I had a teacher who um, they were literally, that's what they're trying to figure out. How do we get a longer uninterrupted time of play? Which was interesting because they had several children with um, several disabled children with various needs, but an inclusion specialist was asking them, is there a way to get to take out some of your transitions? Mm -hmm. um, because that's where big problem happens and she was just literally thinking of this child who can barely walk this child who doesn't pay attention to group the group plan is I guess one way to think of it um you know just a child who really doesn't notice that other people are going down the hallway this way so she's going to walk you know, the other way, way. um <laughs> and so she's like can we do less transitions and I'm like how can we make longer play and then we we're like oh we have one goal actually. So we were trying to figure it out and they did have like a, they wanted a community time, a group time, circle time, whatever. And we came up with what if you did it at the end of your outside time. So all the kids come over, you do your thing and then you all, you're heading inside and we have a really large playground. So it was a way of gathering the kids and it was just a song, one teacher's leading it. The other teacher's just finding kids. They just go and join the song when they, are ready and it um and then the teacher was trying to figure out because they would have somebody do the weather looking out the while window. we're outside yeah that's no, they, that's... no when they because they used to do this inside and that's why they didn't have time to go okay. you know outside for as long <laughs> and suddenly she was like this light bulb of, oh they can just like oh yeah what do you think <laughs> um, or oh did you notice the weather it's like yeah uh -huh. and i didn't say this i think she'll get there at some point soon, because this change just happened a few weeks ago, we don't need any kid to tell us. They all experienced it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many years have they been experiencing the weather? Of you know what the weather was like. I, yeah. I do have to notice that uh, Mike said to let it go. And at the a minute after, Deb drank from a glass with Frozen on yeah, it. Good. So I, I do need to point that out for our other nerds who might have picked up on that. <laughs> Yeah, and Deb and I had planned that for like we were. Of course, I said just wait for it. I will. I will. I will say, it. let it go. Let it go. <laughs> let it go. So many things. I wish we could get them to let go in the classroom. Where maybe that's the are... title of the book: the ninety-nine things you need to let go. Oh, 
Ooh. You always come there up with these great books. I do. I'm an idea yeah. machine. You are. And I'm going to say, yeah. you know, because I know Rachel Franz is also going to be on one of these uh, this around the same time this one comes out, that I learned a lot from her of, because she would she used to be part of an all outdoor program of, mm -hmm. you know, having those like really soft gloves that just kind of stretch over everybody's hands mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. okay, even when you're in a cold climate, it's snack time take off your giant mittens, put those on while you're eating snack and then put mm -hmm. the giant ones back on and just have a, you know, little, you know, the backpack has those in there or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you can just figure out, or it's raining. Oh, you brought your raincoat. <laughs> um, but finding ways around, you know, the excuses, I guess, um, mm -hmm. that come up of, oh, well, we can't go out and play because this or that. And yeah, obviously there are times, um, I'm in Minnesota, when it's 20 below, yeah, we're going to play inside. But <laughs> if people think of it differently, every place, every space, sorry, is a play space for kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the hallway might be the place. Yeah. If you have a gym in your program, you know, you're lucky enough to have that, but it's echoey. What about the hallway? And I know some. Oh, places. oh, we're not allowed to play in the hallway. But that's yeah. that immediate, the immediate no. Mm -hmm. And I get that. And you said that a few minutes ago. Like it's okay to acknowledge that your first reaction is no, but take that da 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 da. Take that <laughs> pregnant pause. Take that beat and be like, mm -mm. Yeah. is it really no? <laughs> like, what is the worst possible thing that's going to happen? And not to go into the Lisa Murphy isms, but you know what page is it on? And who told you right, that? Right, yeah. And, what really is honest to God? Is this going to kill anybody? Oh, well, well, well. And really 99% of the time, it's just that we've never done it before. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So be, be the trailblazer. Yeah. Be, be the trailblazer. And, and I also want to acknowledge that this is, well, it can be with programs, but also with parents or whatever that not every community has as like spaces to play. Right. Mm -hmm. That's um, true. But at the same time, going back to what you said near the beginning, Lisa, that if we think of spaces, not just as playgrounds, that we can find more space than we might think. Um, the front of the Highlander School, um, is that Rukia Rogers, or is that her name? Uh, I don't know. Anyways, uh, in Georgia, like half of what they're doing is downtown. Actually, Rachel, one of Rachel's programs in Seattle was in downtown Seattle. They just went for walks and it was on the sidewalks and, and things. It wasn't necessarily the the playground. And and it, when I taught in Brooklyn, I used to walk by the playground, past the playground, and we'd play in the empty field. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was only, you know, 10 foot by 15 feet. I mean, you know, it was New York. So, um, and that was the only place in the entire borough probably that yeah. had just grass. I think this this allows us to go a little deeper psychologically or maybe more philosophically is that I think depending on what our internal framework is of play, mm -hmm. do yeah. we think that play only happens in a visit location as one of the articles I read, right. um, it, you know, oh, oh, it's a destination location. So the play happens here, but there's play happening. I'm sure all four of us could talk mm -hmm. about a moment or two or three just even today that you were playing or right. feeling playful and and I think that that mind shift sometimes allows people to become more open to what we're what we're doing and where we're doing it well and I I think I want to go back to the hallway in the huh you know we can't, yeah that's what i that's where my brain right? started to go yeah. with the hallway we don't yeah, play in the hallway you walk in a hallway oh well I, 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 the thing is, I think the thing that we that is another sort of block for us because we're in the moment and it's snowing or it's a blizzard outside or it's a hurricane as we <laughs> ready to experience up, don't remind me i know i'm sorry um but it why do we all have to do it at the same time why can't we open the classroom door, have some materials out there that children want to take mm -hmm. out there, have a teacher in the classroom, a teacher in the hallway? Why does it have to be everybody has to go Move into like a herd at right. the same time, right? Uh, so that's another one of those, the early childhood culture 
Yes. And actually school culture in general created the idea that everyone eats at the same time. Yes. They all have to sit at the same table. So they're all like two inches away from each other. Yeah. And like, that's not, you know, again, what page is it on? That mm -hmm. there is no research that, that shows, shows that. that's the way kids have to eat because it's it works. Because it it's 1149. Model, yeah. You know, it's yeah. based on the factory model. Right. Still. It but, is. And then the adults get annoyed at the noise level because every child in the program is in the room eating at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a sort of thing of we create that yes. and then we we stress about it. Yeah. But we also it's hard to see but outside we created of that. Or, it. <laughs> you know, they're worried like for where I work, they're probably worried. What will the curriculum specialist say? Um, and, you know, so I would say, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do <laughs> yeah. That. Why can't, my doctor why once can't, said to me, doctor, what? this hammer hurts when I hit myself with it. What should I do? <laughs> Let me hold that hammer for you. <laughs> why can't, why can't children eat when they're hungry? Right. Right. Well, I mean, what are we teaching them? Child what adult care food program rules. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh. And, and, and then we wonder why five-year-olds are anorexic and having eating issues because we've yeah. essentially said you're lying when they told us that they were hungry at 10 o'clock and we're like, no, you have to wait till 11. You're not Lots. hungry. And you're yeah. like, ah. well, and don't I, listen I to your body. To the, don't listen to your body. So I wrote a, I wrote two chapters in Learning from Head Start, which is a book that was published, I don't know how many years ago. And one of them was on the schedule and eating times, snack, breakfast, and lunch. And every teacher I talked to said, oh, we can't do that because we're on the USDA food program. So I called the USDA. <laughs> And this I, is why said, I, love Deb. I need to talk to someone about the guidelines they are giving for the USDA food program. And they said, sure, we'll send you over to so-and-so. And so they sent me over to so-and-so. And I said, I'm writing a chapter in a book called Learning from Head Start. And these are the, these are the barriers that teachers are giving me and they're blaming me. And I thought it, I, I should come to you and see if this is really true. And so he said, oh my God, they're blaming us. What are they blaming us for? And, I, and so I shared with him, they're saying, well, they can't do self-serve snack and they can't do um, this sort of thing for breakfast or this sort of thing for lunch because you won't let them. And I said, I don't think that. This is what I think the intention is behind that particular rule. And he, and I said, so here's what I think. I think you want, you have guidelines that you want children to be offered food that's nutritional periodically throughout the day. The day, yeah. But it doesn't, and the amount of food needs to be in accordance with USDA guidelines in the amount of food that's available for the children that are in that classroom for that particular period of time during the day. And I said, is that true? He said, yes, that's true. And I said, so what I'm hearing from you is that the USDA guidelines are there to ensure children are getting food periodically throughout the day. Yes. But you're not saying that everybody has to eat at the same time. He said, absolutely not. And I said, but that's what they believe. And so can you send me something? Exactly. I want that in writing. I want it in writing. It's right. in the Learning from Head Start book. He said the USDA's position yeah. on this blah, blah, blah. Also, let's note the word guideline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will find the verbiage loophole everywhere. Guideline. Everywhere. Guideline. Right. Yes, they're guidelines. Yeah. But it becomes so, easier. It becomes easier when you have, when you have, you know, 24 people in one room right. to be like, you have to sit down right. and, and have that gets down to efficiency. Stuff. We exactly. need to make that sure factory model. Right. And, and what's efficient about that? 26 yeah. kids are spilling their juice at the and same time. And what are time. we in a hurry to get to next? Yes. Oh, that's right. that stupid clock on the wall. Yeah. And that's a, yeah. Breaking down that barrier of, yeah, the attitude, like attitudinal barrier, right? That mm -hmm. mindset of we have to be the most efficient and Efficiency doesn't work when you talk about relationships or about humans. Especially you can't children. be efficient no matter what field you're in. 
being efficient in the medical field means people are not actually telling the doctor what they need, what they've exactly. noticed about themselves. Exactly. And you know, the medical field wouldn't exist without nursing that isn't based on efficiency. Well, Why? I shouldn't, I mean, there's definitely pressures too. Yeah, but, to be efficient, to right? Be efficient. But at the same time, that nursing as a profession works against that. Yes. Right? That, no, you are there for the patient. And you are there, you know, that's that whole thing. You, you start so with Mike, the patient. You, I'm having you know, a brainstorm. Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, yeah. I, I, well, my brainstorm is about the parallels between the nursing profession and and good early childhood. And by right. good early childhood, I don't mean that you're ticking all the Eckers box and you're ticking all the yeah. NACI yeah. predation boxes. I'm I'm talking like hardcore what children actually need. To you mean something where the children get children. something. <laughs> exactly. And I, I that that would I'm sure somebody maybe has already done right. that, but that would be a really kind of curious yeah. parallel. Like, like what are nursing homes? You know, I think of my own father's end of life care and. You know, it's you see the people who are just there to like change the bedding, yeah, and barely notice that there's a human being on that. And there's mm -hmm. the people who are like talking to that person and changing the bedding, and it might take them longer. And can certain you, people might it might take even longer. Can you teach but that? Can you teach it? It's a disposition, mm -hmm. so you can coach it, I think, but mm -hmm. it's coaching over time, which again is not an efficient method, right? I right. mean, they, you know, that's why we get these two hour standalone trainings as if that's going to change practice right. versus coaching. Yes, yes. Okay, well, this has been wonderful as always. I, I truly, I love these conversations, but I'm really excited for the book. Um, I've been uh, tasked to write the new intro um, to working with children with disabilities. Oh, so, um, well, now, no, no. While we have Mike here, yes, is I it, believe the language needs to change. Children with impairment children. is what we should call it. Oh, no. I always hold did. on. I would, say, I would say disabled children. Disabled, disabled children. children working yeah. with just a introduction. Since it's still rolling, I will say the reason is from the person's perspective, their disability is part of them. Right. They don't take it off. It's not a coat they take off. Right. And when we say person with disabilities, people talk about that as being person first, mm -hmm. which can be read as, I see you as a person, even though- You have a disability. You have a disability. Okay. I, so I see you as a person, even though you're in a wheelchair. Or intro or to working with, ch with disabled children. Yeah. And that's okay. something that a lot of people in the various disabled communities uh, talk about, for sure. It is a little bit of a mind shift yeah, because we were taught, first. yeah, we were taught children with autism as opposed yeah. to autistic child, blind, uh -huh. child, deaf child, uh -huh. right? Uh, and and that might be a little bit of a hiccup um, because yeah. I, I I could see how some people would think that somehow now that was negative. Uh -huh that kind of language and um, learning from Mike's book and yeah. online and some of the other articles that I've been reading, mm -hmm. uh, it actually is, you know, and, and I think here's what I wanna say is when you're getting the preferred language from that demographic, why mm -hmm. in the world would I question that? Would you right. question it? Exactly. Right, and, and so Mike, I wanna, I'm using your books as the foundational structure sure. of designing the course. So. I may be saying, make sure I haven't done any blunders yeah, in yeah. unintentional right. appropriate blunders. language, right? Yeah, yeah. And we I have him come be a, a good, guest speaker. My yeah. editor did um, have me put in a little explanation of why that language and and it oh, was great. borrowed from disabled activists. I, you know, right. like I don't want to take credit for any of the actual language. I just mm -hmm. think of, you know, I'm just the messenger. We're honoring the language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Honoring. Oh, that'll be great. And that's in the latest book, Mike, or in a different book? In the latest one. Oh, it's so. in the latest okay. one. Great. So the, which I'm, I have I'm actually to... scrolling right now, looking to see if I can tell you what page it's on, but you'll see it once you read it. Okay. And then Lisa, if you'll send me any of that stuff that you've got from yeah. Playwork that you feel comfortable sharing, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So then... to give credit there, I am a part of the pop-up adventure play um, 
play work module. So it's a certification and module six was about inclusivity and accessibility in practice. And so there were a lot of resources, both embedded within the program, but then also that I found on my own, you know, cause you do that, you follow down the rabbit hole, right? Mm -hmm. And two hours later, you've printed off 500 pieces of paper of awesomeness stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Mike, we love you. Um, I'm going to close this out. Hold on just one second. Yep. To learn more about IPA USA, please visit our website at ipausa.org. And until next time, keep on playing. Bye-bye.